Thank you all for joining us for another virtual series by Zoho Projects. Today we have a very special guest with us and it is closely associated with the PMP certification. Uh, I'm sure most of you might have already earned a PMP certification or you're perhaps planning to sit for your PMP exam. Well, today we have Mr. Lee Lambert uh, who has been instrumental in the creation of the PMP certification. Uh, Mr. Lee has over 45 years of industry experience and he is known for his thought leadership in the establishment of education and practitioner measurement standards. He is also a distinguished, he has also won a PMI Distinguished Contribution Award and he is a member of the PM Journal Editorial Review Team for over a decade. Mr. Lee is also a subject matter expert for PMI's Earn Value System and he's also a lecturer at the prestigious Washington University Executive Roundtable Series. Uh, Mr. Lee Lambert has also received one of the highest honors by PMI uh, for his groundbreaking applied learning programs, the professional development provider in 2007 and he's one among the rare few members in the industry who have earned a PMI fellowship. Mr. Lee Lambert has authored two books and 32 professional papers and has taught over 50,000 students in 23 countries. In the profession of project management, he has established the standard against which others in the field are measured. Mr. Lee, it's a pleasure to have you here for our webinar. And I'm sure our community is eager to hear from you, understand certain best practices. And uh, before we get started, uh, just a few uh, important instructions. So this session will last for about 15 minutes, followed by a Q&A session for 20 minutes. Uh, you can uh, feel free to post your questions in the Q&A tab. Uh, we have a few moderators who will collect the questions and we post those questions to Mr. Lee towards the end of the session. And at any point, if your video or audio is not clear enough, you can refresh it. <coughs> and we are recording the session and this will be available to you after the session. And for future updates and webinars, you can follow us at Zoho Projects. Mr. Lee, uh, I invite you to present on resource management for project success. Thank you for that uh, great introduction. I got to tell you, every time I hear that, it reminds me of how old I am. Uh, I've, I've been around since the beginning, it seems like, and, uh, and and there's just something new all the time. I never stop learning. It just seems like every year something new comes along. The, the time between the last time I spoke with the Silicon Valley PMI people uh, till now is, believe it or not, 43 years. So some of you might remember that. Were you with me 43 years ago? Well, the fact of the matter is some of you probably weren't born when I spoke at Silicon Valley the last time. But I've always looked forward to it. It's a very uh, assertive group of people, very uh, on the cutting edge from what I remember of, uh, of the process and the project management arena. So I'm looking very forward to it. And I've, I've picked the project topic here that's sort of near and dear to my heart. It's one that I, has really kind of uncovered uh, the way that you go about being successful in the project management world, but it's also pointed out that you need a lot of residual support. You can't, you can't do it on your own. So what I want to talk about today is, is how, do we, how do we manage the resources that we have available to us? How do we how do we get the most out of our resource pool? Now we have to understand going into this that we as project managers are dealing in an extremely difficult environment because almost all of our organizations these days are set up on a matrix format. So the resources are pooled in what we traditionally call silos of certain skill set capabilities and each of those skill set capability pools then provide support to the multiplicity of projects that we're asked to conduct within our organization. So not, not only is the issue of silos and 
cross-functional, cross-horizontal uh, integration of all the work, but there's the, there's the issue of skill sets. We, I, I don't think, at least from my experience, I don't think we do a very good job of quantifying skill sets. And when I say quantifying, I mean what's uh, productivity rates and, and the costs and availability and all the variables that go into assigning resources to any given project or in the real world and against multiple projects, then we have to understand what goes into that. So I want to spend time talking about that. But if I get to the soft side of the resource business, then we've got to talk about motivation and uh, being, being uh, excited about doing the things that we need to do. Uh, so that's something that we have to pay attention to and how this all goes about and lays out into the process. The other thing that when we talk about is, is in the scheduling world, one of the bad things about the scheduling concepts that we use is that we don't really take into account non-productive hours. We plan in effort hours and execute in duration hours. So we really have to pay some attention to that. So this is really where the the, the the idea of a PMO came into play. We we were looking at uncontrolled project resourcing. People just were beg borrowing and stealing resources to support their individual projects. And it was recognized that we need some kind of a centralized process to carefully articulate how these resources need to be applied to the particular projects that we have under undertaking. Now, I, I covered in, uh, in my program yesterday with Nigeria, I covered this uh, idea of strategic linkage, so I don't want to beat that horse, but you got to remember that when we begin to assign resources to the variety of projects that we have, there, there should be some correlation or some relationship to what strategic objectives those particular projects support, so that when we assign resources, we're assigning the right resources to the right projects. So we've got to have that kind of understanding to be able to do that in the appropriate way. So now we have resources that are having to be managed within a functional silo. We have resources that have to be managed on project specific and across multiple project lines. And so you've got to realize that those things have to be kept in balance. And the toughest job for a project manager, and I, I really concluded this, this is the toughest job, is managing the resources that are assigned to your project. Not only managing them, but making sure that you get the right resources assigned to the project. So we look at that from that standpoint, realizing that every project has got just a, a, a plethora of pulls and yanks and tugs trying to force their opinions and their attitudes onto the project, the project manager's got to resolve all of those issues. So we look at it from that standpoint. So uh, next slide, please. You can't just go into the resource store, if you will, and pick them out. Here's the, here's the problem that we have, as I see it. Now again, uh, when I was in the working world, and it's been a while ago since I actually worked for a living, I, I'd rather talk about it than do it, uh, and so, I, but one of the things I found was we have to really understand what our skill set, skill set level capabilities are, because what what ends up happening in our projects, if we're not careful, is that we end up with a skill set mismatch. Because many many organizations still, even in this day of sophisticated automated information systems, we still have people who plan their projects by body count. So if you, if you need a, a body, we got a body. Is it the right body? Probably not. Is it capable of doing what you need? Well, it's a body. And so we begin to fight that battle of don't just give me a body. Don't just give me someone that is breathing. Give me someone who has a skill set that matches the responsibilities associated with the work that we need to do. Now, in order to do that and do it effectively, and then I know this is going to be old news and people are going, oh my gosh, I've heard this a million times. But what you've got to do in your organizations is you've got to develop a detailed work breakdown structure. Now I'm talking about the predictive side. I'm not talking about agile waterfall. I'm talking about the predictive side. Uh, we, we still have some of this we do on the agile side, but it's certainly a very 
a very different approach. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through. But what we've got to have is some a home for the resources. Now, if you remember, those of you who sat for the PMP exam, uh, you remember there's always a question about work breakdown structure, and it's always just one about how, how low do you go. And we, we said in the original PEMBOK, and I think we've softened that a little bit over the years, but we said that uh, you should break the work down until it's about 80 hours of effort, so two weeks of an individual working on a particular piece of work. That way we have the clarity of what the work content is, so we can, we can define what resource skill set we need to deliver that work, and we can monitor it in a way that after, after 80 hours of effort, we can assess, are we, are we getting it done the way we expected it would, and if not, why? So we want to break it down into those components. What we're doing with the work breakdown structure, in addition to defining how we can assign resources more effectively, is that we're also creating the framework for an information system that's going to allow us to make these resource determinations and adjustments on the fly, I mean almost on real-time basis. Uh, when, when I worked at the uh, Department of Energy, on a, uh, a breeder reactor, the Clinch River breeder reactor back in the 70s. Uh, it eventually got canceled by Jimmy Carter, but the fact of the matter was we were working on a component. We weren't even working on the whole reactor. We were working on one of the major components in the core, and our work breakdown structure went down to the seventh level. So we got seven levels of predictive work breakdown structure. And, uh, and that's the level we're going to report. We're going to report at the sixth level. That's the rule. Remember, plan one level below your report. So we're going to report at the sixth level. Well, the, the, the problem was back in 1977, almost all of that work was done manually with a, a tool that some of you are not familiar with. I like to remind people of it. It's, uh, it's called uh, paper and pencil. And we had hard copy work package plans, assigned resources, labor, facilities, equipment, overhead, all, you name it, it's all in there. And then on a monthly basis, we had to collect whatever data we could and report against this uh, hand-prepared document in terms of the DOE report. Well, the problem with that was when we gathered the information, by the time we gathered it and reconciled it, and reported it, one month had passed. So we were now reporting month-old data. So when we were reporting the monthly report to the DOE, for example, if we reported on in October, uh, October 3rd of the year, we're really reporting information from August. So you can see that the value of that information becomes suspect when there's that long of a lag time. But nothing's changed. Nothing's changed except now it's automated. Now we can imply that we can do that faster, we hope better, and certainly provide much better detail. When, when I went up to the Northwest uh, National Laboratories in Richland, Washington, we, uh, we had this requirement to report uh, the, uh, the status of the project. It was a nuclear waste isolation project. Where are we going to put all the high-level radioactive waste from all these nuclear reactors around the country? And so we had to report on a fairly regular basis, and, and they had just put in a very a sophisticated automated system. So when I got there, um, one of my jobs, in addition to implementing project management in a national lab, was to be the liaison with the Department of Energy Project Control Office downtown. So when we first got there, I was impressed with their capabilities in managing uh, all kinds of resources. So it came time to send the monthly report down. Now, I came in mid-August, so I didn't get a chance to really repair uh, anything that I didn't agree with, but, so I had to deliver. So I asked my admin, I said, let's get the monthly report, go down to see the project control officer. So about 10 minutes later, here he comes into my room pushing a hand truck, a, a hand truck. Now, for those of you that are old enough to remember the perforated computer paper, well, this is a hand truck about five feet tall of the report. And I said, what in the world is that? He said, that, well, that's, that's the monthly report. That's what we're sending down to the DOE every month. And he said, they love it. They, 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 in fact, they, want, they think they want more. 
I said, that's ridiculous. I said, a $300 million a year laboratory, and you've got a stack of papers five feet tall that you're using as a much report. I said, Let, let's go down. So we went down, and I, I met the guy, nice guy, good fella. He was a, a good old boy. He had a, had a pickup truck with a gun rack in the back, and, I mean, he was a nice guy. And uh, we talked for a little bit, and then finally uh, I said, uh, pointing to the report, I said, what's this? And he said, what's this? You brought it. It's the monthly report. And I know. I, I, I said, but what is it? Why, why is it so darn big? And he said, well, we, we, uh, we got 12 project control officers that manage all the technical disciplines within the laboratory. And this report allows them to do their job extremely well. And it's, uh, it's something that's made a world of difference in what we do with the information that you provide. I said, there's no way. There's no way you have that much information. There were like a 1,000 people, so it wasn't like there's massive numbers of people and, and trucks and facilities. And, and so I said, that, uh, I'm going to bet with you. I said, if I can prove to you that you're not using all this information, that, you're, that it's not adding any value to what you do, if I can prove that, will you agree to raise the level of detail one? He said, absolutely, but he said, I'm telling you what, we're thinking about asking for more. Okay, okay, let's see how it goes. So I go back to the office. Well, then September, now I've got time to actually prepare the report. I can't change the size of the report yet because I haven't proven anything. I mean, I know it, but I haven't proven it. So I get the report ready, five feet tall, except this time I solved it uh, with some things that make it pretty clear that if they're actually using the information, if they're actually... Uh, taking advantage of what we're providing, uh, then I'm going to probably get a phone call. In fact, I, I know I'm going to get a phone call. And I sent it on down to the to the uh, control office. Never heard a word, not not a single word. Well, that confirmed to me they're not using all this information. And so uh, the next time I prepared it, and I raised it one level because I confirmed they're not using Raised the level, and that went from five feet to three feet. I salted it again with some things that would certainly require a phone call if it were if they were read. Set it on down. Nothing, nothing. Now I'm getting tired of this. I, I I can only play these games so long. So I raise it one more level. It goes down to about 18 inches. Okay, and I salt it again. Except this time I want to put an end to the game. I salt it this time with some things about the control manager's uh, family, mainly his. Uh, his sister and his mother, and I sent it on down, okay? It hadn't been down there five minutes, and I get a phone call. Now I knew who it was. And in 77, we didn't have caller ID, but I knew who it was. I said, yeah, Frank, what's up? He said, Lee, I just got the monthly report down here. And he said, I don't know what the heck you think you're pulling here. I don't know why you think you can get away with something like this, but this is not going to stand. And I said, what? What are you saying? I don't understand, Frank. What's your problem? He said, I'll tell you what my problem is. He said, this thing's been sitting on my desk for five minutes. I've been looking at it. And he said, I got a question for you, Lee. He said, didn't this used to be a lot thicker? He still hadn't read it. When I left there in, uh, in uh, at the end of that year to come out in 81 to come out to uh, Columbus, Ohio, where I am now, uh, we were reporting to the DOE with a 24-page report, okay? Now, here's here's my message, and I'll spend more time on this, but I want to point it out to you. Because we have now come up with this idea of a PPM, a Project Portfolio Management Approach, which, which if you really are paying attention, it needs to be a holistic approach, not just the projects, but the entire organization needs to be uh, incorporated into the PPM. But the problem we have with the automated capabilities if I plan the work well, if I assign people appropriately, then I can keep track of that. I can, I, and almost on a regular basis. I mean, I've known some organizations to report weekly because they can with the PPM. They're able to do that and keep on top of things. And, and one of the things I always say in my classes is the information that you have is what you use to manage the future. Whatever's happened in the past will continue to happen in the future unless you do something about it. So when we got that kind of capability, we, we completely improve our ability to make management decisions. The better the decision support information, 
the better it is. Okay, so now let's go back for a second and talk about some things we need to consider. When we're planning uh, an individual resource on a work package, and let's say there's fi there's finely defined content, scope again, I'm in the predictive world now. When I look at that and I believe that I can assign a resource to that and I say oh, it's eight eight hours. And we, as I said before, we plan in effort hours but we execute in duration hours. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if that individual who says it's going to take eight hours to do that work, and then they're assigned to two or three projects, you see, they don't have eight hours committed. They have eight hours over time. So we have to make a calculation to determine how much time is that resource going to give me on my project. So there's a little formula for that. I share it all the time. People really find it useful in having these conversations with resource pool owners when they try to say, wait a minute, I gave you this guy for eight hours. What's your problem? Well, you did, except they're working on two or three other projects, so I really only got them for two hours a day. So what was going to be one day is now four days. So we've got to look at that. So what you do is you take the effort hours that's been given to you by the resource. We, we want people who, that's what they do. The skill set max is there. They're going to tell us how long it's going to take them in effort hours. Now, I've got to divide those effort hours by productivity because, as you know, and as I certainly know from my years in this business, all resources are created the same. So because a person is called an engineer doesn't mean they have the same skill level capabilities as another engineer in the same organization. So we, we over the over a period of time we start to develop productivity rates. In fact, in sophisticated organizations, if I can use engineering as an example, they'll have three levels of engineers, and those levels are indicative of the productivity rates. So if you've got a junior, you've got someone that performs at a 90% productivity rate. If you've got a journeyman, that person performs at a 100% rate. And if you've got a subject matter expert, they actually perform at a 110% rate. It makes a difference in the amount of time that you allocate to that particular work depending on the skill set that you have. So you've got to factor into that productivity. Once you have that data point, then you've got to divide that total by availability. So now we've got this person who says, uh, I'll use an example of eight hours. Uh, so we've got an eight-hour estimate of effort hours, okay? Now when we get assigned, maybe we get signed Bob. Bob, we look at Bob. Bob's, a, Bob's not been doing all that. Bob's got a 50% productivity rate. So I take that eight hours, divide it by the productivity rate of, of, of 50%, and now we know that that effort hours is going to be 16. We're going to be 16 hours, not eight, 16. But that, that's, the e that's the easy part. The hard part is, oh, Bob, how many projects are you working on at the same time? Because in our organizations, we, we don't have pure assignments. So if, you, if you've had a dedicated project team once in your life, it's probably more than a lot of us ever experienced. I've had two. Uh, it makes all the difference in the world. But in today's matrix setting, you don't get dedicated project people. You get people available at certain times. So you say, well, how many other projects are you working on? Well, I'm, I'm working on three other projects. This would be the fourth project I'm working on. And so you divide that into your 16. And what was eight just a minute ago is now 64 hours. Now, it's not 64 billable hours. It's 16 billable hours. But based on availability, that individual cannot get your work done until 64 hours have passed. That's duration hours. And if you're not doing that, if you're not taking into account the difference, then you're going to pay a price. And that, by the way, begs the question, and this is especially where we have a lot of IT capacity, uh, when you beg the question of 30%, sometimes as much as 40% of an individual resources are devoted to maintenance and operation. So now they're, they're not even available eight hours a day. They're only available six hours a day or less. And so all of those factors need to be considered. Now, if you're having to do this by hand, like I did back in the, in the 70s with General Electric, well, you can see why people get frustrated and people get uh, 
uh, almost uh, depressed about how difficult it is to do that by hand. Well, not with the PPM. The PPM allows us to do it very quickly, and we incorporate those things into the process. So we've got to look at that from that standpoint, because that changes, by the way, think about this, that changes your project cost curve. Because based on when they're actually working and actually billing, that will change that cost curve. So that eight hours of, of effort that we started with now is going to be spread over 64 hours, and the costs are going to be appropriated in two-hour increments especially, effectively. So that's what we want to get to is a capability that we can do that. So when you, when you go into the resource store, you've got to know what you're going in for. You, you, you don't just go in and say, give me a body. Uh, give me a level three engineer uh, in, uh, at a cost rate of X or Y. So now, now you've got some parameters that you can go to in there. This is the problem we make on our projects. When we, when we plan and schedule projects and use sort of arbitrary resource allocations, because we know there's always going to be more projects than there are people to do them, uh, then we create basically a false plan a plan that's going to be subject to change almost immediately. Now, if you're if you're in the agile world, this makes you start to think, well, gosh, no wonder we, we went to agile, because in agile we don't plan these things in long term far out all the way to the end. We plan them in short increments. If you're doing if you're doing two week sprints and you're doing stand up meetings and that, that's all you gotta deal with. Okay? And so you you, you have a less of a chance of poor planning then the predictive side does trying to determine what the future is going to look like 18 months or two years from now. So in the old predictive model, some of you might remember the old PMBOK, we had a, con a con content in there that said rolling wave planning. And what we said in that, this was way before Agile, what we said in that is we, we don't want to plan in detail after the rest of the project. We want to plan in shorter increments. And then as we get closer, we reach out and pull in more detail. Sound familiar? That's agile or hybrid of agile if you want to look at it that way. But the fact of the matter is the key to success is appropriately planning the resources, being able to identify skill set mismatches, skill set deficiencies, so that we can make sure we have the right people to do the right job. Otherwise, you get into quality issues, you get into costing issues, you get into schedule problems. Those are the things we need to be able to do. And the first step is to select the right resource, the correct resource, the best matched resource that we have available from the pool that we have to work with. Uh, I'll tell you what, this is, uh, this is something that, uh, it looked easy when you said it fast. I mean, when I got... When I got involved with this, in, in the last couple of years, I've been doing some uh, uh, not 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 difficult work, but I've been doing some some evolutionary work with a company in Ireland. Some of you may know the company called Chorus Systems, and Chorus Systems is very big in Europe. They're not so much here in the U.S. Uh, but uh, as I started to dig into their product, looking for how to do this better, how to do it more effectively, I've begun to realize the power of a PPM approach to managing projects. Uh, back, in the, back in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, Paul Dinsmore, he's a fellow PMI fellow uh, who lives in Rio. He's from Houston, but he lives in Rio de Janeiro. He wrote a book at the time called Managing Organizations by Project. And unfortunately, he was ahead of his time because that's really kind of where we are right now when we talk about holistic enterprise project management. That's really kind of where we were. But he was, he was ahead of his time, and a lot of people didn't really uh, grab onto it. And, and probably a lot of that was because we didn't have the automated capabilities to support that kind of an approach, but we do now. And so what you've got to do is invest the time that it takes to create the base plan so that it's going to change. Well, you're not going to have a plan that doesn't change. If you do, you're probably lying. You're going to have a plan that's going to change. What we want to do is take our best shot based on resource allocation to specific work tasks 
And then as the project proceeds and as we report status, we can begin to project into the future. We can do trending. We can do resource reallocation. If a, a resource pool owner comes in and says, all of a sudden, hey, I need to take your two subject matter experts and here are two interns, I can immediately define, using the formula that I provided to you earlier, I can immediately define the impact on the project. So if this project is number one in the hit parade, if it's a high priority, strategically an important project, this gives me leverage to prevent resource reallocation decisions being made without the proper consideration. So what you have to realize is you're you're not going to save any work up front. In fact, you're, you may have to do more work up front to get the baseline established. But once you've got a reasonable and realistic baseline established, now with the use of the automated capabilities that we currently have, you can manage that. It, it's going to look like you're actually managing it. You're not guesswork, not seat of pants. You're, you're managing that darn thing. And that's what we want to... That's what we want to focus on is we want to make sure that we are creating the base. This is, this is the problem because we are moving at such a fast pace that if we don't have a PPM approach, some kind of an automated holistic approach, it's going to pass us by before. We're not even going to know what happened until it already happened. With the PPM, with the right resource loads, and I'm talking about facilities, computers, use time, all the variables, not just not just human resources, but all resources necessary to conduct the project in, a, in an appropriate way, uh, if I can't almost immediately know the status and project that into the future, I'm going to look like I'm confused. And the fact of the matter is, you probably will be confused. Now, here's the thing. Uh, I can convince you Oh, I can convince you how important this is. I mean, I, I was a little reluctant at first. I thought, oh, gosh, it's just another IT fiasco, another uh, piece of money wasted on IT projects. And then finally, all of a sudden, I began to realize, you know what? This, this is here to help. I can become uh, probably one of the best project managers that ever walked the face of the earth, not because I'm that smart, but because I have the information I need to make it look like I'm smart, okay? But here's the problem. You've got to convince management. You've got to convince senior level management that it's worth two, two things. You've got, to, you've got to convince them that it's worth it to uh, purchase and implement a PPM approach. I don't care who's, I don't care which system you buy. I don't care. You got to allocate time to implement it, time to make sure it's integrated uh, both vertically and horizontally, uh, and they, they are cheap. I don't know if you've priced one lately. I, I haven't because it probably scared the heck out of me. But it ain't cheap. Uh, and it takes time. Uh, sometimes a couple of years are needed before it becomes what I call a mature PPM, where it's really fully integrated and timely and automated and all the things that go along with it. Well, that's big. If you start to look at your organization, even if you're in a small organization, you look at implementing a PPM, it reaches out and touches, but it has to, it reaches out and touches almost every component of the, of the organization because all of those components are necessary to be effective in managing all of the projects. And so as we start to see disconnect from strategic linkage, we can make quick adjustments and, and regain that connection. All of that is incorporated into it. But now you've got to convince management that it's worth the investment. And it's, it's a short-term cost with a long-term gain. And that sometimes is difficult because we, we don't even do long-range planning anymore. In the world that I've worked in for years, long-range planning was next month. I mean, that's how fast things were changing. So without an automated capability, uh, you, you can't keep up. You just, there's no way you can keep up. And when you make an assessment, it's strictly by seat of the pants. It's guesswork based on experience. Uh, but with the PPM integrated fully, you've got data. You've got data that represents the reality of the project. Okay? Now, this slide I created years ago uh, to try to make my point. Uh, of uh, the difference between a subject matter expert 
and what I call a subject matter zero. So there's opposite ends of the spectrum. This is the, the subject matter expert that everybody wants. I mean, gosh, give me Lee. Lee's the guy I want. I need Lee for my product. My product is really important. I need Lee, okay? And so you go to the resource pool owner, you try to convince him that you need a Lee on your team, and he said, okay, well, listen, I don't have Lee. I don't have a Shmi, but I can give you a Shmo. Uh, and that stands for subject matter zero. And in fact, if you look at the pool that I've created here, and this is pre this is pretty accurate, there's a heck of a lot more schmoes than there are schmees. And so, when we're assigning resources to our projects, we cannot fall victim to thinking that the work output, quality, uh, and cost, and, and time of a schmo is not equal to that of a SME. And so we've got to make those assessments and when we can't dictate the resource assignment. We, we, can, we can impact it by, uh, by being able to connect it to strategy. So it's important. So we probably ought to get a subject matter. We can try that. But you've got to remember that the resource pool owner is measured on his or her ability to have a flat histogram. So in other words, they're, they're applying all of the resources uh, effectively across time. There's no overcommitments, there's no undercommitments, and if they do that, then they, they're heroes. They get a big bonus at the end of the year because they used all their people effectively. But the problem is projects don't execute that way. Projects are executed on a more traditional S-curve basis where you start low, you build up to a high, and you tail off at the end. So now you see resources aren't flat lines. We, that, we, in fact, if I, if I see an organization that projects have flat lines in terms of resource utilization, they're, they're, using, they're wasting a lot of money. They're not getting the highest level of performance out of their people. So we want to look at that from that standpoint and be able to recognize that that's there. Now, here's what you can do for the resource pool owner. They, I, I've often said, and I still believe this, they may be the most important people in the project management world because they dictate who you get and how long you get them. And so here's where I can turn that into a win-win. Let's say the resource pool owner is reviewing their histogram for resource allocation across time, and he sees in week seven he's uh, four people overcommitted, and in week nine he's four people undercommitted. Now he can come to you as a project manager or to whomever is using his people during that time frame and ask a very simple question. Uh, is the work that my people are doing for you, Lee, are they on the critical path? And you say, well, let me take a look. Why? And he says, well, if they're not on the critical path, if I could slide their work by two weeks, that would bring down the overcommitment and bring up the undercommitment and would have a flat histogram. So you say, well, let me take a look. So you look and you say, wow, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry that it turns out that the work they're doing is, in fact, on the critical path, so I really can't help you, okay? Well, that's okay. The, the resource pool owner goes in, all right, thank you for looking. I appreciate taking a look. And what's he going to do now? Well, he's going to go to the next project that's using some of his people, and he can continue that until he brings down the overcommitment and brings up the undercommitment. Projects aren't being impacted because we're not going to do anything on the critical path, yet we're making friends, if you will, with the resource pool owner because you just got him or her out of, the, out of the bond where he was going to show under an overcommitment. Now he's got a flat histogram. Your project hasn't been impacted, and we go on with business as usual. So that's, that's the idea behind resource planning. Now, the other thing that goes into this is motivation and inspiration. you got to remember when you're dealing with a subject matter expert, different motivation techniques are going to work with that individual than they were with the schmo. The schmo doesn't really know much about anything. They need mentoring. They need uh, cajoling. The shmi, in fact, most shmees don't want to be helped. They, they, they almost get offended if you try to help them. So you just got to track what they're doing. You got to keep them on track. If you don't, if you don't control the subject matter experts' efforts, they'll take your project wherever the heck they want to take it. So you do have to put some control. You have to have some uh, way to uh, review what it is they're doing to make sure they're staying consistent with the needs of the project. So this is the idea of a resource pool. And if you haven't been thinking about this, when you load up your resources, 
you're probably missing an opportunity to create the illusion that you're a genius because this is what it lets us do. And when we say we're going to slip schedule, they say, what do you mean you can slip schedule? You say, well, uh, it's going to take subject matter experts to keep this schedule. And right now, all I've got in this subject matter zero is working on this project. So you can begin to communicate in a positive, effective way uh, and not take hits for what you're going to accomplish or not accomplish. So that's the idea behind the resource pool. Again, going back, and I have to say it again, if you haven't created the framework, if you haven't created the numerical structure uh, of all these work packages in this uh, WBS or however you're deciding to do it, if you haven't created the integration points, then, then you're not going to get the value out of it. Then, then I would say to you, you know, maybe you know, don't waste your time and all that detailed planning. But if you're going to do it right, you're going to take advantage of the automated capabilities. And a lot of the major organizations have very sophisticated, the, the Honeywells and the Bechtels and the Apples, and those, those organizations have very sophisticated PPM uh, processes in place. Uh, and, and every organization needs one, and they don't all have to be as expensive as it would be for, for a Bechtel or some of the larger construction firms. But you need to think about this. And then, as I said on the previous slide, you got to sell it. If you, if you can convince yourself there's value in managing these resources in this sort of a way, then you got to sell that to the people that make the decisions. Okay? Now, here's, here's the other. This is a management issue, not really a project manager's problem. But let's talk about this for just a minute. Uh, we see this, and I see this a lot in the IT world, not just predictive models, but in the IT world. You know, the IT people have a reputation that, that uh, they promised the world and, and delivered, you know, uh, Silicon Valley. So you've got to look at this and you say, okay, uh, we're going to track your progress, okay? Now, here's the reputation you have. If you're an IT person, don't take offense. This is just what I hear. Uh, you, you have a, let's say you have a four or five month project, okay? No, let's make it a three month project. And so you talk to the IT person responsible for it. You say, I need to measure productivity. I need to measure how you're doing against the expectation of three months. And so we want to put in some milestones. Well, IT people don't necessarily like milestones. They, they, they're a little bit too much accountability for them. And so they'll say something like, well, no, no, that's, look, I'll tell you what we'll do. Uh, we'll give you a percent complete at, at the end of each month, and that will give you some sense of are we going to be making the three months okay. I said, well, I'm not thrilled with that, but if you'd be honest with me, if you give me a candid percent complete based on what you know to be true, uh, then, then I'll, I can live with that. Okay, good enough. That's the way we do it down here in IT. So the first month comes to an end. You go down to the IT guy, and you say, hey, IT guy, how are you doing on the project? And the guy, the IT guy, says, well, I thought you might be coming down. I'll tell you what, we're uh, we're a month in now. Things are going pretty well. It looks to me like we're just about 33% done. I said 33%. You're at third end of 33. Well, that's great. That's awesome. And that's that's just straight up. That's where. You're, yep, absolutely. That's what we do down here in IT. So you go back. You don't have to run anything up the flagpole. There's no problem. He's on schedule. Everything's going just the way you thought it would. In the two months, you go down and say, hey, Mr. IT guy, we're two-thirds of the way in here. Uh, how are we doing on the project? And he goes, Lee, Lee he said, you're not going to believe this. He said, but we're about 67% done. I said, you are 67% done. I said, well, you're right. I, I don't believe it. But if you're telling me honestly and with candor that that's where you are, uh, I'm going to accept that because we agreed on it. So off I go. Don't run anything up the flagpole. All right, now at the end of the third month when I go down, what am I going down for? Think about it. What am I going down? I'm going down for product. I'm going down for output, okay? And so I say, hey, Mr. IT guy, I'm here to get the, get the end result. How did how, you do? He said, oh, Lee. He said, it's unbelievable. He said, we're, we're, just, we're almost done. We're, just, we're, we're so close to being done. We have a little interface software to write, but we're basically done. We're, about, we're probably 97%. Uh, and, and he said, uh, if you, we're so close. If you want to just uh, uh, status it as done, that you can go ahead because we're that close. I said, no, no, that's all right. I'll wait. So at the end of the fourth month, they're 98%. At 
at the end of the fifth month, they're 99%, and finally at the end of the sixth month, three months late, you get the deliverable. Now, here's what's happening, and, and I'm not picking on IT people. I think I used to do this when I was in a predictive model as well. But if you look at this, basically what we're saying is we've got to have a better way of determining progress. Uh, we need to define that. So when we're when we're running behind on an IT project, we don't do much about it until the in this example, till the end of the third or the start of the fourth month. And when we do at the start of the fourth month and we communicate to people we're behind, the first thing management wants to do is give you more resources. In fact, I've heard people say that management called me up and said, uh, if we gave you 10 more programmers, would that allow you to get finished on time? Well, those of you that do this for a living know 10 new programmers at this stage of the game is going to do nothing but make the project be even later. So we have to be able to understand what the impact of resources will be. And we need to make that decision early on. So. If people aren't being candid and truly assessing, by the way, the reason they've made those candid assessments is they don't want to get, uh, they don't want to be picked on in terms of, hey, you're missing schedule, what's the matter to you? They, so they just play that, what I call the game of optimism. They give optimistic assessments of progress, hoping that they'll catch up. Well, they never do. Well, they, they almost never do but they don't have any opportunity to do anything about it until it's too late. So in this example, the end of the third month, they finally realize, hey, we ain't going to make it. And, but it's too late now. It's too late now. So what we want to do with our information system that have tied all of our resources together is we want to be able to make quick decisions about the impacts resources are having in either overperforming, underperforming, uh, any of those issues can be identified very quickly, especially if you're doing regular reporting, uh, monthly even, as some, some organizations like to do two-week reporting. Well, you could never do that with, without a PPM. Back in my day, you know, we couldn't do, we couldn't do one month uh, manually without being a month behind. So uh, with the PPM, I can give you this almost on a real-time basis. At the end of the business day, I can define and tell you what the uh, status is at the end of that business day based on inputs coming through the integrated pieces of resource allocations on all the projects going on. Not only does it improve your job as a project manager, imagine how much more awareness there will be at the senior level, at the strategic linkage level in terms of impacts of project status. So this is something that you have to pay attention to because more isn't necessarily better. You need the right resource at the right time, not an army of resources. And so that's something we have to make a decision in project management using the data that lives in the system to tell us what the actual status is. Well, I can't believe uh, our time has gone already, uh, but I do want to I do want to kind of close with the idea that with Agile and with the way we run our Agile projects, so, and there's some things I love about Agile, so I don't want you to think I'm against Agile, I'm not at all. But uh, some of the things I really love about Agile is that you get early feedback on performance. So when we look at the idea of a, of a sprint, let's say we're doing two-week sprints, okay? Uh, and uh, we look at that and we say, well, in that two-week sprint, every day we're going to have a stand-up meeting. Uh, every day we're going to have a stand-up meeting. And, and the implication is the right people are involved, the decision makers are involved, senior people that necessarily need to be involved. And here's the beauty of that. In the stand-up meeting, uh, because it's happening on a very short term, I mean, how much can you screw up in one day? So we look at that, and everybody that's attending the stand-up meeting uh, and has to respond to three components. Uh, what did you get done yesterday? Okay, what did you get done yesterday? Uh, what do you plan to get done today? And what's going to be in the way of you accomplishing what you plan to do? Those three components. Now, in, in predictive models, we don't, we don't get to those questions until some regular uh, scheduled time frame. Uh, in, in Agile, I'm doing this every single day. 
So as I point out something that is going to be difficult for me to get my work done, I can act on it. I can get decisions to be made that quickly. Now, does the information system support that? Yeah, it does, but you're going to see a lot of movement in the evolution of requirements through the Agile process. So that dictates you need a flexible process that allows you to make those uh, modifications and changes and, and, uh, and, and incorporate them into the next cycle that you go through. So the system is important for any approach that you do. The PMBOK, just so you're aware, if any of you are thinking about getting your PMP, uh, get it now, get it this year, don't get it after January 1, get it based on the uh, edition, sixth edition of the PMBOK, because in the seventh edition, when it's uh, January of this coming year, 50% of the content of that PMBOK will be Agile. 50% uh, predictive uh, or hybrid and 50% Agile. Uh, so we want to make sure that we get it. I, I would not recommend waiting. I think the test is going to be a, even more difficult. I think it gets more difficult every year. But you need to understand that there's a change coming. That it was supposed to be in July this year that moved it out to January. So you've bought yourself a little bit of time. But what you want to do is you want to become PMP certified. You want to capitalize on that capabilities that reside within the PMI chapters that you participate in and benefit from programs like this where where you where the chapter provides you opportunities to learn from people who've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I appreciate your time today. I hope this has been useful to you and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Well thank you Mr. Lee. That session was very insightful and uh uh, we're, we're really uh, delighted that you've actually been there, done that, and got the t-shirt. And we hope someday we'll be able to follow some of your uh, teachings, and hopefully we also get to wear that t-shirt someday. Well, Mr. Lee, it was a pleasure listening to you, and, and we've already received some feedback from a few of your listeners who said that uh, they found this session to be very insightful with a lot of frameworks for managing resources. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to address our community here. And uh, for future updates and webinars, uh, you could follow us at Zoho Projects. Thank you all for attending this webinar. Thank you. Have a good day, guys. Thank you.